Pets. I'm Kaylin, as always, and I'm back! I'm back! I'm so excited to be back! Um, for those of you that wondered what happened and why I kind of dropped off the face of the planet for a while, the UK has just gotten out of the first phase of lockdown, and in the meantime, around February, I really sort of just hit a wall mentally with, with lockdown, and I was very busy with schoolwork. I honestly still am going to be a bit busy with it because I have some big projects that have due dates coming up, but I really just got to the point where I was putting a lot of pressure on myself, and I needed to take a step back from that pressure because not only was I worried that I wouldn't be able to meet the deadlines I had set for myself and my school deadlines, I was also worried about putting out content that just wasn't as high quality. I spent a lot of time researching my episodes and the editing process, even though my editing process is relatively simple, it still requires me to kind of dive through a lot of audio footage and especially for the episode that I'm releasing, you know, this episode that you're listening to right now, I'm toying around a lot with editing snippets of music in, and I just kind of had to take a step back for a bit and take a break and let myself sort of recoup mentally. And for those of you that commented on my Instagram post about it, I really can't thank you enough for being patient with me and for being so understanding. I didn't really feel that great about having to take a break because I didn't want to abandon my audience, but I am very grateful for all the good reception that I received and all the messages asking if I was all right and promising that everything was going to be just fine. And thank you guys for all your support and thank you guys for continuing to interact so positively with the podcast. It's really nice to be back and I'm excited to get to talk to you guys about some fun stuff today. And without further ado, while I drink my classic cup of peppermint tea, I am going to talk to you guys about classical music. And specifically, we're going to talk about the differences between Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart. And... In the last episode, which feels like years ago, honestly, um, the last episode that I put out, I said specifically the difference between Mozart and Beethoven, but I was worried that it wouldn't result in an episode that was quite long enough, so I decided to add Bach in there as well. And of course I have to add Bach because, fun fact, I actually played Bach in my fifth grade production of Compose Yourself which was a musical about these kids that accidentally fall asleep in the muse in a museum about music and all these composers, these statues of composers, they come to life and they teach the kids about music so they can do it for a school report. So yeah, that's my claim to fame. But yeah, so let's dig into it. So in the world of classical music, there are really fewer names that reign more supreme than like Bach or Mozart or Beethoven. And they're among some of the staples of classical musicians. They have so many iconic pieces that you could probably recognize within the first couple of notes. And if you ever took music lessons, you probably learned even how to play a couple of these songs on the piano. In fact, you probably know several people who claim to be proficient in piano, and then when they get the chance to play, they just sort of pluck out the beginning of for release and only play that and continue to hoard the piano so no one else in your lunch period before choir class can get a chance to play. Becky. No Beckys were offended in the making of this podcast. The narrator did not even go to school with someone named Becky. This situation, although familiar to many, is hypothetical. Please remember to take turns with the pianos. Enjoy the rest of the episode. However, it's really easy at a first glance, or at a first listen, I guess I should say, to mix these three composers together when, in fact, they all represent different sorts of genres and time periods in music. So starting chronologically, Bach comes first in this timeline, and if you've ever listened to a Halloween playlist on Spotify, you'll probably recognize this piece right away. So Johann Sebastian Bach was a German composer during the Baroque period, and you know how much I love the Baroque period. It's bougie, it's extra, it's everything. 
but as much as I love the Baroque period, I've always kind of leaned more towards the classical period, like Mozart's music when it comes to the music of the time. But this is sort of an unfair judgment on my part because I really haven't made as much of an effort to seek out box music when I listen to classical music. I'll admit that I'm still exploring the repertoire that Bach has to offer, but what I have listened to so far, I have really enjoyed, and I was really happy I got to listen to more of it in preparation for this episode because it's been nice. So Bach is particularly well known for his skill on the harpsichord and on the organ, but he was also the son of a string player, so it's very possible that he could have learned the basics of string instruments from his father. He also learned how to play keyboard instruments from his brother, who was actually a student of Johann Pachbell. So if you ever heard the canon in D before, which is really common for weddings, then you'll recognize why that's significant. So Bach was the organist of the Georgian Kirch. I apologize in advance, there are a lot of things I'm probably likely going to mispronounce in this episode. Bach was the organist of the Georgian Kirch until 1703, when he was just 18, and he would have had access to a very large collection of music to study, but mainly music that was religious in nature. After he left Georgian Kirch, he then became the organist of the Neuite Kirch. However, from 1705 to 1706, Bach took some time off to learn more, and he actually walked nearly 200 miles to Lubeck. And his employers at the Neue Kirch weren't very happy that he just randomly took this time off and went on a walking journey to a different town. And he was gone for so long that he wasn't really accounted for. But Bach had also picked up some tricks while he was out and about, and apparently accompaniments became so intricate that the congregation really struggled to follow along, and Bach suspected that they were trying to box him in because he thought that they knew his potential as a musician and as a composer, and figured that they didn't want to lose him to other opportunities, and eventually some other opportunities did come along. So Bach eventually left and began composing cantatas for religious occasions, and it's around this time that he writes his famous Toccata in Fugue, the one that we actually just listened to. However, Bach throughout his life was very quick to become dissatisfied with his employment and he would often complain about being boxed in and not being paid enough and he would go off again from Neue and move on to Weimar and this is something we're actually going to see a lot of in the lives of these composers. We'd often expect for it to be a more lucrative position than it actually was because we look back in time and we recognize their names and they're such massive figures to us we figure that they must have been extremely wealthy because in a time like today you don't usually know someone's name unless they have wealth or power to go along with it but this definitely wasn't the case at the time. It was very easy for a composer to basically go hungry if they didn't have a patronage or they didn't have a stable job or they weren't actively teaching students how to play different instruments. So bear that in mind as we go throughout this episode. Bach goes off to Weimar and he ends up becoming a court organist at the court of the town and he was tasked with writing a cantata each month. And so having this massive responsibility in place, Bach really began to explore and expand his musical styles. So think about the toccata that we listened to earlier. It sounds very much like something you'd hear inside a dark, gloomy, echoey church. It's something that really makes you feel like you're under the eye of God and it would make you feel pressured to repent for all of your sins. And now that Bach has gotten a bit more of a prominent position, he has the ability to access more music from the likes of Italian operas and composers like Vivaldi, and you can hear more upbeat style in his works around this time. In fact, check out part of his cantata number 182 that he wrote in 1714. So already it sounds a lot more upbeat and you can see his style that he's developing. He's utilizing more Italian techniques like da capo and ritornello, which means that he's using repeating sections in music as well as alternating between contrasting passages in music. And these are things that might seem pretty normal to us now, but with the theory of music, there were still things that were being developed. So Bach is therefore making these grand statements with his music. It's something that's very interesting. It's new, at least to 
the region of Europe that he's in. So despite the fact that Bach is learning all of this in Weimar, once again, he doesn't like to be tied down and he moves to Kothen, which I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. So he moves when he gets another opportunity that he likes better. The Duke he originally worked for in Weimar, Duke Wilhelm, initially didn't want Bach to go, but he eventually had to let him go and Bach instead went to work for Prince Leopold of Koten. And it's during this time in Koten that Bach would begin to work on solo pieces for violins and cellos, which would have been especially revolutionary for this time because instruments like cellos, for instance, wouldn't really have been considered solo instruments. Bach's famous cello suites were composed during these years of 1717 to 1723. And some of these are among his most famous pieces today. So after Bach eventually moved from Koten, he moved to Leipzig as the director of church music for the city, and here Bach began to embark on a very rapid pace of composing cantatas, writing nearly 52 in one year, which, if we do the math on that, that's writing a whole cantata every week, and that's something that's just quite ludicrous to think about. And some question whether or not Bach struggled with inspiration during this time, or if he were writing merely out of duty, but regardless of the motivation behind these compositions, he clearly has a lot of great technical skill and talent to just crank out these works regardless of passion. And now that he has this technical German training mixed with the Italian styles that he's come to learn, he's changing the tone of music throughout the Prussian Empire. He also worked on several songs for mass as well, and he also published his first collection of organ music and another book on preludes and fugues for the harpsichord. He also went on to perform for the likes of Frederick the Great of Prussia. Russia, which you guys know how much I I love just bringing up facts about Russia for no reason. or It's really not a fact about Russia. There's this Russian TV show that I enjoy. It's on Amazon Prime. It's about Catherine the Great. And there's actually a scene where they're discussing the Seven Years' War and Frederick the Great is doing a flute and harpsichord recital. Frederick's playing the flute and Bach is actually playing the harpsichord. And oh, it's hilarious because this messenger comes in and he's like, um, your majesty, uh, Russia's just declared war with us. And Frederick the Great just being the ball of sass that he was sets down his flute for a second and he's like, don't bother me with trifles while I'm playing with music. Bach, please continue. Oh, I just, that is the energy that I want to have where I'm just so unbothered with stuff that like you could tell me that a war is starting and I'm like, okay, I'll handle this after I finish my, my flute recital. Oh, iconic, honestly. So anyway, back to Bach's career. He's performing for many great people. He's building a name for himself. However, Bach's musical career and his life would come to an end very shortly after this rise to fame. Bach tragically began to lose his vision and after complications from an eye surgery, he died in 1750, but it wouldn't be long before the world saw another musical genius stepping out of the shadows. And I'll get into that after this. Hi, I'm Steven, and I am the host of a podcast named The Composer Chronicles. Each Wednesday, I delve into the stories of composers both past and present. Historical episodes focus on a particular work by a featured composer and examines their life during the time the piece was written and performed. Once a month, I feature a living composer and allow them to share their own stories and give personalized insight into the industry. But that's not all. The Composer Chronicles hosts additional miniseries that explore the film and video game music industries that each feature composers and professionals in those fields. So if you're ever asking yourself, why are cannons being used as instruments in Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture? Or what makes a Disney song so catchy? or even what does one have to do to become a composer, then The Composer Chronicles is the show for you. You can stream The Composer Chronicles wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. So, come and join me, and together we'll pull back the curtain on the world's greatest music makers. And now, back to the story. 
1756, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was born in Salzburg, Austria, to a family very dedicated to musical genius. Mozart spent his childhood learning from his father alongside his sister, and it's clear from the beginning that Mozart has a unique talent. They say that by the time Mozart was three, he was plucking at chords on a piano, by four, he was playing melodies, and by five, he was composing. His first composed piece was a minuet in G major, and keep in mind, he was five years old when he wrote this. Five. Dude, when I was five, I'm pretty sure I was eating dirt in my backyard, so I definitely wouldn't say I'm anywhere compared to Mozart. It's quite incredible. It's truly astonishing to hear someone play with this sort of mastery at such a young age. And by the time Mozart was six, his father took him and his sister to perform across the courts of Europe. Some even claim that Mozart was so well trained that he could play a melody on the violin perfectly, even while blindfolded and held upside down by his feet. And at 10 years old, little Mozart published his first music. It was a series of sonatas for keyboard and violin specifically dedicated to a royal princess. And once again, these pieces are just incredible. So next time your head gets a little too big thinking you're hot stuff, just remember about Mozart's talent and skill and you'll be humbled right away, completely guaranteed. So during all this time spent across Europe, Mozart is really able to garner influences from different places like Great Britain, France, Italy, Prussia, and when he's 12, he writes his first German opera called Bastien und Bastien. And eventually around the age of 13, he was appointed as an honorary concertmeister at the court of Salzburg. And Mozart's father was happy to be gaining notoriety for his children, particularly he noticed that his son was the one that people really gravitated to, but he was hoping to earn more money than he had been from this tour. There were a lot of times where they would be tipped in trinkets rather than money, and it was something that frustrated him a lot. So after this tour with Mozart's sister, Mozart then goes on a tour of Italy with his father, and one famous story during this tour is... Oh my gosh, why is every door in my apartment complex opening? And one of the famous stories from this tour is that Mozart and his father heard the famous Misere of Gregorio Allegri sung by the Sistine Chapel Choir. And this piece was considered so exclusive that people were forbidden to make copies of the music. However, Mozart, being the genius prodigy that he was, he listened to this piece once and then was able to perfectly transcribe it from memory. And that was the closest we could get to downloading music on LimeWire back in the day. Which apparently I was like the only person that actually bought music because I was like so terrified that you know those piracy commercials always scared the crud out of me and I was like easily that one little annoying kid that was like I have to do everything right by the book so sometimes I think about the dent I probably just made in my finances by trying to be an honest person oh well so from the late 1760s to the early 1770s, Mozart spends a lot of time working on operas as well as eight symphonies, four divertimentos, several works for various churches and worship purposes, and an allegorical serenata. After this, Mozart went back to Italy for a while and he was wildly productive once more as he wrote another opera and several string quartets. And after this, Mozart went to Vienna with his father in search of favorable employment. Vienna was the it place to be during the time. It was a massive city filled with great opportunity and opportunity certainly came Mozart's way. He found a great deal of inspiration in Vienna and he wrote his first piano concerto in 1773. <laughs> Even though this was great, 1774 would only get better for Mozart. I'm talking symphonies, I'm talking concertos, serenades, religious songs. Mozart had a great new job as a concertmeister writing church songs for the area. Mozart was also working on an opera buffa, or a comedic opera, and eventually Mozart felt like he wasn't really able to use his talents that well, so he went back on the road to get more inspiration and more exposure. And first he went to Munich and then to Paris, although 
he would eventually end up moving back to Salzburg upon hearing of his mother's sickness and his mother's eventual death. Then, in 1781, Mozart departed from Munich, and here Mozart had big plans. He was employed by an archbishop, but Mozart eventually had ambitions to meet Emperor Joseph II, who he did eventually meet, and the emperor was so impressed with him that he gave Mozart a lot of support with commissions, as well as a part-time position at his court. And the archbishop that hired Mozart wasn't too happy with this, and this not only led to contention between Mozart and his employer, but also between Mozart and his own father, who sided against Mozart. And Mozart then decided he was going to pursue an independent career in Vienna and not have to worry about appeasing a patron. And this was a really big step to take to not necessarily be under someone's employ. As we mentioned earlier, this isn't a very stable career to be a composer. But luckily for Mozart, this is where things take a turn for his career. So once in Vienna, he often performed as a pianist and had, quote, established himself as the finest keyboard player in Vienna. And in 1782, he finished composing the opera The Abduction from Seraglio, which was widely performed throughout the Germanic areas of Europe. And this also really launched Mozart as a composer during this time. He wasn't seen as just a musician. He was known for the music that he was writing. He wasn't just a performer. He was a creator. And Mozart also met his wife, Constanz, during this time. And he studied a great deal of Bach and Handel's work, as well as other Baroque masters. And this would end up inspiring one of Mozart's most famous operas, The Magic Flute. And then in 1784, Mozart met Joseph Haydn, one of his contemporaries who was greatly impressed and went on to tell Mozart's father, I tell you before God and as an honest man, your son is the greatest composer known to me by person and repute. He has taste and what is more, the greatest skill in composition. Mozart continued launching more and more concerts featuring his work, and he began to develop a substantial wealth, and eventually he made a triumphant return to opera with some of his most famous works, such as The Marriage of Figaro, which was a sequel to The Barber of Seville, and The Marriage of Figaro actually became so popular that, that the opera group of Prague requested Mozart to come to Prague and write an opera specifically for them, where Mozart wrote his famous, and one of my personal favorites, Don Giovanni. <laughs> I mean, spectacular, show-stopping, talented, incredible. It just sends chills down your spine. I just can't wait to hear it in person one day. Sometime last year, at the very beginning of 2020, I said something along the lines of, not to be dramatic or anything, but if I don't get to see Don Giovanni live this year, I may perish. So you can guess how I've been doing. <laughs> it's okay, I'm fine. They might actually be performing Don Giovanni in London sometime this year, so even if you have to wait a bit for your dreams, kids, they can still come true. So in the later years of the 1780s, Mozart began to shrink away more from the public view and actually began to squander his money a lot more and he developed a reputation for asking for loans and aid from various people and he also began to suffer from a terrible depression that slowed down his productivity and eventually in 1791, Mozart fell ill and became obsessed with writing his Requiem, but he actually died before he could finish it and left his student to finish it for him.
haven't shown you the whole thing, but if you listen closely to this piece, you'll notice there's a shift in style where Mozart stopped writing and his students stepped in to finish. And this piece also demonstrates the very massive dysphoria that Mozart was experiencing at the end of his life, which is very tragic because he died when he was only 35, and it's sad to think about what he might have been able to accomplish had he lived longer? What kind of music would we have been able to hear from him? What mastery would he show us in his older age? But it's something that we'll never know. However, shortly before his death, Mozart actually became somewhat acquainted with a younger, up-and-coming musician who he thought showed a great deal of promise, and this man would prove to be a musician who would stun the world with his ability to create incredible music despite the declining state of his ability to hear. Born in 1770, Ludwig von Beethoven is a German composer and arguably one of the most famous composers in the world. When you think about classical music, his name will automatically come to mind, and you can usually think of his Ninth Symphony for Elise or Moonlight Sonata, and his works mark this interim between the classical period and the Romantic era of music. So he's weaving between these more mathematical compositions of the classical period to more emotional and unpredictable pieces in the Romantic period, and we mainly recognize Beethoven's music in three initial states. We have the early period, the middle period, and the late period, and I'll get into more detail as we go throughout his story. So like Mozart and Bach, Beethoven was also raised in a musical family. His grandfather was a musician who had passed it down to his father, and Beethoven's first music lessons were from his father, and he also received lessons from other musicians in the town as well, and also from other relatives. And he not only learned keyboard skills, but he also learned how to play the violin and viola. However, Beethoven's musical education was not a particularly lighthearted experience. Beethoven's father, Johann, would often give his son physical punishments for failing to meet his expectations during lessons, and the accounts of this are just heartbreaking. Neighbors would speak of seeing the young Beethoven in tears while he played, standing on top of a footstool to reach the keys, and his father would beat him for every hesitation or mistake. Some accounts even say that Beethoven's punishments included flogging, being locked in a cellar, being purposefully deprived of sleep in order to endure extra hours of practice. It's absolutely cruel. His father was desperately trying to create the next Mozart, and while Beethoven was considered by some to be a prodigy, it just wasn't as natural for Beethoven, and he would continue to struggle with the impacts of this abuse for the rest of his life, as anyone would. It's a terrible thing to endure. And this standard of perfection that Beethoven always feels like he can't quite reach is something that he's going to hold over his own head for a long time afterwards. But Beethoven's career did take off at a young age. By 1782, he became an assistant court organist and later the continuo player at the Bonn Opera, Bonn being the city in which Beethoven lived. He also had his first published composition in 1783, Nine Variations on a March by Dessler. What makes Beethoven's music stand out from others during this time period is that he has this classical training and he has influence from these other great composers, but once his personality comes through in the music, it's unlike anything else. There's this suddenness to it. He can make these surprising jumps in his music that makes things less predictable and somewhat more emotional than the music of his predecessors. Beethoven's also credited for this ability that he has to somewhat mimic other sounds from different places. He can easily capture the feeling of French folk music or Slavic folk music with relative ease, and this opens his music to an audience outside of his town. It's something that appeals to a wide variety of people. And by 1787, he had made such an impression in the world of music that the Archbishop Elector of the Holy Roman Empire sent Beethoven to study with Mozart, which is such a crossover, it's very exciting. However, Beethoven's time with Mozart was cut short due to his mother's declining health and death, which is interesting because there's another parallel with Mozart that he has. Mozart himself had to leave behind an opportunity due to his mother's declining health and death as well. But we do have this really interesting quote of what Mozart thought of Beethoven. Mozart supposedly said to one of his friends, Mark that young man, he will make a name for himself in the world. 
and he was right. So Beethoven remained in Bonn for a while, and he made his living playing in the city orchestra and tutoring private pupils, and he started making more of a name for himself, and in 1790, Emperor Joseph II died, and Beethoven was actually invited to compose a funeral ode for the late emperor. However, this piece didn't end up being played at the funeral because the wind players thought that the music was too difficult, but Beethoven would eventually improve this music later to celebrate the ascension of the next emperor, Leopold II. And Beethoven's music also caught the eye of another famous composer, that of Joseph Haydn, who was so impressed with his composition that he invited Beethoven to come and learn from him. And Beethoven would leave Bonn in 1792, and because Mozart dies around this time, people really begin to look at Beethoven with this expectation of, oh, he's going to be the next Mozart. So Beethoven spent a lot of time studying Mozart's music when he moved to Vienna to learn from Haydn. Beethoven also spends a lot of time studying music and mastering the art of performance. Performance. So this goes on to gain the attention of a lot of people in Vienna, especially the aristocracy at the time, and he eventually becomes known for giving these wonderful performances and for being able to improvise even better than Mozart could. This period is considered Beethoven's early period because there's a great deal of Viennese influence from Haydn with also some flares of Beethoven's own personality, but we haven't seen him reach his full individuality in his music yet. So while he wasn't actively publishing music in the earlier years of the 1790s, he was still composing, and eventually, down the line at the turn of the 19th century, he publishes a great deal of sonatas, string quartets, and a septet, which actually began to set him apart. People began to recognize him for his own style, and not just for someone else's music or influence, and his music and presence are soon in very high demand. During this time, Beethoven was hired to teach the daughters of a Hungarian countess, and Beethoven actually ended up falling in love with one of these daughters. Her name was Josephine Brunswick, and he actually went on to write Sonata Opus 27 Number 2 for her, or as we refer to it today, Moonlight Sonata. And while this romance didn't really work out for Beethoven, this beautiful piece of music really allows us to catch a glimpse of the depth of his emotions. But emotional turmoil aside, Beethoven is starting to make a great deal of musical publications. He's writing symphonies, he's accompanying a ballet, and he's writing an oratorio. And because Beethoven is in such high demand, when this oratorio is performed live, he's able to charge three times the usual ticket price because people are so eager to see him. And now we take a step into what is known as Beethoven's middle period or heroic period, and also what would form one of Beethoven's most significant tragedies and triumphs of his life. Beethoven stated that his loss of hearing began possibly around 1798, and by 1801, it was clear to Beethoven that this was a very severe case. Today, Beethoven likely would have been diagnosed with autosclerosis as well as a degradation of the auditory nerve. It's also likely that he suffered from a very severe form of tinnitus, as he said that in his left ear, he would sometimes struggle with higher pitches and being able to hear what was being said if someone was speaking quietly. Yet also because of his tinnitus, he was very sensitive to loud noises, and if somebody were to yell very loudly, the sound would be practically unbearable for him. So to cope with this, Beethoven moved to a smaller town outside of Vienna to escape some of the terrible towns of the city. And here Beethoven's mind goes to a darker place. Here we have a man that lives for his music. It was his passion. It was his calling to create such beautiful compositions. It was something that was all he knew, really. He had been abused as a child for not reaching the standard of perfection in music. And now how can he continue working on his music if he can't hear? Letters during this time show that Beethoven was deeply depressed and likely considering suicide, but thankfully he was able to overcome this period of depression and decide that he would continue composing for as long as he could. And he wrote to a friend that he planned to seize fate by the throat. It shall certainly not crush me completely. 
Thankfully, Beethoven was so skilled with music and the logistics of it that he could still write music based on what his memories of the sounds were, as well as the use of the mathematical nature of music to determine the length of notes in each measure. And what's interesting, too, is that the piano has made developments since its invention. If we first look at the harpsichord, like the type that Bach was playing, it's not easy to play with different volumes based on how hard you press on the keys. But the pianoforte, or as we've shortened it to piano, allows the player to create these incredible dynamic sounds with the keys based on how hard you press. And if you've played the piano before, you can feel the vibrations within the keys that become more intense the harder you press down and you feel as the vibration wears off. So Beethoven utilized this sense of vibration to help with his compositions as well. When it came to conducting live performances, however, Beethoven did struggle. He was sensitive to loud noises and he was increasingly struggling to hear quieter sounds and eventually average volume. He couldn't just pick up an instrument from an orchestra member to feel it and he can't listen along with the music as easily to guide the players along in what they're doing so it became more difficult to determine what and how they were playing and how it needed to be conducted. A lot of people think that being a conductor just means you just sort of wave your little baton around in time with the music, but there's a lot more active participation than that. A lot of people have to be very engaged with the music. They have to master the piece so well that they know what's being required of the music and they know what they need to ask for. They need more gentleness from the string section. They need more determination and tenacity from the winds. Like it's something that's very intricate and a lot of people underestimate how much engagement it requires to be an effective conductor. So this would eventually lead to difficulty for Beethoven and he would withdraw a bit more from social circles to cope with this frustration. However, this increasing loss of hearing seemed to create a determination within Beethoven as well. And when he returned to Vienna, he went back to his compositions with a vengeance, making a lot of grand music pieces. And one of these pieces that is especially famous during this time is that of the Eroica Symphony, which he actually originally called the Bonaparte Symphony, but he eventually changed the name due to his increasingly low opinion of Napoleon as his hometown of Bonn was actually invaded by the French. There were a lot of increasing tensions and wars taking place throughout Europe that were basically Napoleon's fault because he wanted to rule everything. <laughs> So Beethoven then goes on to work quite heavily in the theater world. He composes an opera called Fidelio, although the threat of French soldiers coming into Vienna interfered a great deal with his success. But within the next decade, Fidelio would be able to gain the recognition that it deserved. And now it's recognized as one of the most popular works in German theater history. It has a great impact. Beethoven was also getting a lot of funding from aristocratic patrons during this time. And Beethoven is also having some more romantic romantic plights as well. So some say that Beethoven perhaps viewed quite a number of different women as his potential soulmates, but who can blame him? I have the same thought every time I see a handsome and well-dressed man on the bus. But anyway, among his belongings were unsent letters addressed to my immortal beloved which sounds like an Evanescence album, but a lot of people have wondered who this immortal beloved could have been. And some have suspected it to be Therese Malfatti, which was the niece of Beethoven's doctor. And this lady is actually to whom Beethoven dedicated for Elise. And some thought that perhaps it might've actually been Josephine, the woman that he had written Moonlight Sonata for. And we might not ever truly know for sure who the Immortal Beloved was, but it's clear that Beethoven has a lot of passion. Now, as we approach the 1810s, we reach Beethoven's late period. And during this time, he studied the works of some of the older masters like Bach and Handel, which inspired something more fugal in terms of his work. But most importantly, during this time, people recognize the music from this period for being especially emotional and full of personality and expression because Beethoven also went through a variety of emotional turmoil during this time. For instance, his younger brother Casper died of consumption and Beethoven also developed what was referred to as an inflammatory fever and he, despite his health declining, went through a long and intense legal custody battle for his late brother's son. And thankfully by 1818 things started to look up for Beethoven again. He was receiving a commission from the Philharmonic Society of London for a symphony, which he's utilizing his famous Ninth Symphony for. He's also completing famous works such as Musa 
Misa Solemnis and the Diabelli Variations and his Misa in the Ninth Symphony are performed in Vienna and people said that it was absolutely incredible and that it was a work of inexhaustible genius. And on May 24th of 1824, we have Beethoven's very last public performance. And in 1826, Beethoven completed his last composition, which was his replacement for the finale of the Opus 130 Quartet. By the beginning of the next year, though, it became very clear that Beethoven wouldn't live for very long, and he was then swarmed with old friends and gifts from his patrons in order to pay their tribute, and in one instance he received a very expensive cask of wine, and upon seeing it, he whispered, pity, too late. He would go on to die on March 26th of 1827, leaving everything that he owned to his nephew. His funeral in Vienna was attended by nearly 10,000 people, and many other composers and musicians were also in attendance to pay their respects to this great master. So there we have it, three of some of the most famous classical music composers, and I hope this helps you understand the difference between Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven a bit better, and that perhaps you can start telling the difference between some of these genres of music as well, and maybe even a greater appreciation for classical music than you had before, because these composers represent a time in music that we don't really get to see much anymore. How often do we see composers writing complimentary pieces of music for whole orchestras can the respect that they deserve. We don't really see them in the limelight anymore, and people that write these pieces, it's usually just background music for a movie. And not that that's not important, because music does play such a huge part in setting a tone for something, but it's so rare for us to see genius like Mozart writing incredible pieces a day or even hours before a performance. And if we do have genius like that, how often is it being buried away from the attention that it deserves? It's hard for any musician or creator these days because it's so easy to have your work get lost in swarms of other things being created every single day. And because of all of this, it's easy to get discouraged, but don't be. Because what makes a work of art meaningful is the passion that you put into it. So that's it for this week. I don't know if I can really promise a consistent upload schedule, but I will certainly try my best. I have some more projects that are due, so it could be a bit before the next episode, but thank you guys again for being so patient with everything. It really does mean a lot to me, and I'm happy to be back, and I'm looking forward to getting to publish this episode for you guys. And if you enjoyed this episode, or if you enjoy this podcast, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, follow. Every platform is a little bit different. You you can check out my channel on YouTube or my Instagram page at Tea Time Thoughts Podcast. If you would like to patronize the show, you can go to the Tea Time Thoughts Podcast Buy Me a Cup of Coffee page, and you can also use this to send messages to me or make recommendations for the show. I'd be very happy to hear what you guys would love to learn more about because I like seeing what you guys are interested in, and it gives me the chance to learn a little bit more about it too when I do the research for it. So I'm always happy to hear from you guys. And again, thank you guys so much for all of your support. Don't forget to tune in next time when I talk about The Great Gatsby. So that being said, this is Tea Time Thoughts, and I'll talk to you next week. Mm -hmm.